Hello, I'm Gordon Lynch. I'm one of the professors in Religious Studies at the University of Kent. I just want to take a few minutes today to talk about how ideas from the study of religion can help us to make sense of how society is responding to the current coronavirus crisis. Now, you may well have seen different stories in the media about how religious groups are responding to this, the way in which some religious groups are involved uh, in important welfare uh, activities in their local communities, religious leaders calling people to prayer or before the current lockdown, the way in which some religious places of worship were acting as places of solace um, for people as they were coming to terms with the crisis. But when we think about religion and coronavirus in that way, we're thinking about quite traditional institutional forms of religion. And what I want to do today is to think about how other ways of thinking about religious aspects of social life might be relevant here. Now, one of the thinkers who's been most important for this wider way of thinking about religion or religious processes being central to society, it was a French writer called Emile Durkheim. He was born in 1858 and did most of his academic work, influential academic work, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And Durkheim was a pioneering thinker in the emerging field of study then of sociology, um, writers who are interested in trying to understand modern society, the way in which modern societies uh, were changing in the midst of all kinds of social and cultural and technological um, economic change that was taking place in that period. And although sociologists brought different interest to that work, one of the things that Durkheim was particularly interested in is the question of what holds societies together. What are the structures that bind societies together? And although he had different interests within that, one of the things that he particularly focused on was the role that moral feelings or moral sentiments, moral symbols played in creating people's experience of society. And towards the end of his life, he wrote arguably one of the most influential books of the past century in the study of religion called The Elementary Forms of the Religious Life. And what Durkheim argued there was that all societies are organised in some way towards what they take to be sacred. These sacred forms, these sacred symbols, which stand over and above everyday life, they connect us with what people think is most important, most morally significant, uh, in life. And that the sacred is something that people connect with through ritual, through uh, moments, special moments in time, special activities which give us a powerful sense both of connection to those moral symbols but to a large group of people connecting with them. But also an, an important part of Durkheim's understanding as well was of the sacred was the idea of the profane as well. The profane being things that could pollute or corrupt uh, this, this kind of ideal, perfect, um, sacred, which was the kind of central focus for social life. Now, one of the most important things that Durkheim uh, argued with that understanding of the sacred was that anything, in principle, could be taken to be sacred. By society. So it didn't need to be a god or gods or supernatural beings. It, it could be anything in principle could within a society come to be the heart of its sacred values. And so in the modern world he suggested that nationalism, uh, we see the idea of the nation becoming sacred, the idea that people give their lives for the nation or that the nation has a supreme call on people's duty becoming an increasingly important idea. Similarly, in a time of climate crisis, we see for many people the idea of the environment taking on a sacred significance as well. And through modern times as well, another form of the sacred that's arguably been really important as well has been a humanitarian sacred. The idea that the greatest moral call on us is to relieve human suffering, regardless of who's experiencing that suffering regardless of their creed, their ethnicity, their nationality, their beliefs, that human suffering and the relief of human suffering is the greatest moral duty uh, that we have, the greatest moral call on us. And arguably in the midst of the coronavirus crisis what we're seeing are forms of 
reconnection with this humanitarian sacred. And this shows up in a, a number of different ways. So we see in, in a number of ways the ways in which uh, workers in the health system and in, in social care uh, now really seen as having the status of being moral heroes. They represent our best values in uh, placing themselves at risk to care for others. And alongside that we have um, rituals such as um, last night the Clap for Our Carers um, ritual where people are coming onto their doorsteps to um, show their appreciation for people working in, in health and social care. But where that got recirculated, not just through people experiencing that in their local communities, but through people uh, posting videos on that on social media, and then also um, saying how they kind of felt choked up, how they felt moved by that as an experience. And when you feel moved, when you feel choked up, when you feel teary by seeing stories about the sacrifice that um, health workers are making or by uh, public events like the CLAP, for our carers. That's arguably an example of that kind of Durkheimian ritual where we're all being bound together in a sense of collective moral uh, community, a sense of having a deeply felt shared values that we're experiencing in a particularly powerful way in that moment. And just in the same way that uh, Durkheim's idea of the sacred came with this idea of the profane, the idea that there were things that could pollute uh, the sacred or that were the, the polar opposite of the sacred. So we see um, examples of people um, who disregard social distancing um, requirements, uh, businesses who are taking exploitative uh, approaches uh, to their workers or people un unnecessarily stockpiling food becomes seen as the kind of profane other, the kind of the moral other to the sacred values uh, of care that are really coming to the fore at the moment through this crisis. So one of the things that's really important when we think about the sacred in this way is that we don't always assume that um, the sacred in society operates in ways that are helpful or good. Now there's much that I think we would really want to celebrate and cherish uh, in terms of the values of care that are, I think, becoming very powerfully felt at the moment. I'll we'll say more on that in a minute. But the sacred, when it creates people as moral symbols, can have downsides to it as well. So when we think about health workers as being moral heroes, particularly when they're putting themselves at considerable risk, uh, treating patients uh, without adequate protective uh, equipment. That can be a kind of powerful moral symbol, but that can overcome a little bit the, the question about whether we should really be expecting health and social care workers to be putting themselves at risk in that way. And similarly, whilst perhaps in some cases moral shaming can be an important way in setting boundaries about what kind of behaviour societies think are acceptable, or not. We can also see uh, cases where moral shaming around coronavirus arguably goes too far. So stories in the media yesterday about, yesterday about the police being called um, about a, a man who was sitting in his car in his driveway or someone else who'd gone by himself uh, for a run twice in one day rather than once. So sometimes when we cast people as moral symbols, either as sacred moral symbols or as symbols of the profane, there may be more complex uh, social realities going on uh, beneath them that those kind of more simple moral stories can, um, can cover over too much. I think another really interesting question that Durkheim's theory raises for us as well is one of the things that Durkheim wrote about in the elementary forms was about the way in which when people experience those temporary rituals, those uh, powerful sense of connection with the sacred, they can go back to their everyday lives afterwards, almost with a sense of, well, what was that about? You know, almost a slight sense of uh, how strange that was, almost slightly embarrassing, a sense of the kind of otherworldliness of that ritual. And I think back to um, when Princess Diana died and the very, very powerful outpouring of national grief that there was then. A few months afterwards that seemed almost a slightly strange experience in terms of how powerfully that had gripped uh, Britain as a country during that time. 
And I think one of the interesting questions for us in terms of thinking about the coronavirus crisis is that arguably this is making us aware again of deep humanitarian values, sacred humanitarian values, which certainly I'd see as being very important for how we think about society, how we think about trying to craft our politics, how we try to look after uh, each other in society and where we're seeing important lessons from that about the importance of community, the importance of care, the importance of international collaboration, all things which have arguably been pushed back against by some of the populist politics uh, that we've seen in recent years. Now, one of the questions is, we may be experiencing through something like Clap for Our Care is a very powerful moment of reconnection with those values of care, but what will we do with that in a few months' time or in a year's time or two years' time when the coronavirus crisis, the, the acute phase of that has really passed? Will we really allow our connection with those values to actually change the way we act, change the way we vote, change the way we do our politics? change the way we think about our priorities, what we think we should do in terms of uh, how we pay tax or what, what we do in terms of uh, funding public services. Though questions about international collaboration that may also carry over to how we think about doing dealing with the longer term crisis we face with climate change as well. So there are questions about how we carry forward those powerful sense of connections with values that we experience in times like this, into everyday life beyond that, where it's easy perhaps to get caught up in the mundane things of, ev mundane things of everyday life uh, and to lose a sense of the importance of those values. So I guess some of the key takeaway messages from this more generally are that in everyday life, sacred values in society can often be hidden, but they still stand as a, a kind of central focus through which societies come to come together, come to experience themselves as moral communities. And often those sacred values only come to the fore at times of sudden crisis or tragedy or celebrations such as humanitarian disasters, mass terrorist killings or, or moments of public celebration like the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics in London. And forms of the sacred can bind social groups together, they can create a very strong sense of moral community, but they can also operate sometimes in ways that can be deeply socially divisive. They can encourage ways of acting that are deeply altruistic, um, that are, are profoundly important in terms of uh, our, our moral motivations. But they can also lead us to act in ways that are inhumane towards those who are, are cast as profane. But I think understanding how our moral values aren't simply a question of what's good or right, but how they actually operate in society, how they actually operate as social processes, is a really important way of how we think about the religion as the sacred in the modern world. And that's certainly something that we can take from Durkheim's work, and is arguably, I think, one of the most important ways in which we can think about the study of religion uh, and its relevance in today's world. So thanks for listening today. Stay safe and uh, take care. And thanks for your time today. Thank you.